I believe that God is calling the young again in another great crisis of... Uh, he was the bishop who led a monk's life. So people like me, as you can see, are not saints. Gosh, we're far from that. Nor the a charismatic religious leader. He was the mouthpiece for God as far as we were all concerned. He was the direct line to, for, to sainthood, to, to, um, to Christ-likeness. Appearing regularly on television with his identical twin brother, he gains celebrity status. I always say it's, it's the Vatican or nothing, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> always go to the top. And what hurts us are for over 15 years, he served as a bishop, part of the establishment, powerful, trusted, seemingly deeply spiritual. When I became Bishop of Lewis in 1977, I wanted not to live as perhaps bishops should and do on the whole. I wanted to go on living the monastic life. This was the background for the scheme. And the scheme is an opportunity for young men and women to give a year of their life entirely over to God in a monastic setting. The setting, his home in East Sussex, Scores of young people stayed with him for up to a year, many vulnerable teenage boys hand-picked by ball. I roll them out of bed at five o'clock in the morning and they come down to an hour in the dark. Living and praying together, ball claimed the scheme would help the youngsters get closer to God. A shy, lonely 19-year-old with a devout interest in the Bible, Cliff James was one of the many to join Peter Ball's scheme. He prepared his victims. Uh, it wasn't just suddenly he assaulted us. He had prepared us through convincing us of our specialness over months and months and months, convincing us of how and he chose his victims very cleverly as well. He chose um, people who were vulnerable, people who were unsure about their identities at a, very, at a young age. From the outset, Ball insisted the teenager shower naked in front of him. Mind controls and manipulation from, a very, very, from the very beginning. He said that um, to follow the example of Christ and St Francis would be uh, something I'd have to do to humiliate my to, to overcome my pride, um, as Christ, as St Francis did. How would you describe the nature of his offending? Sadistic. Um, he got, his offending was sadistic. I was bruised um, and he would beat us with um, a clothes brush, a wooden clothes brush. Um, he, well, he beat me, I don't know about the other survivors. Um, yes, I would be bruised and I, in great pain for days. A sadistic predator, Ball tried to silence his victims, claiming what happened was consensual. It seems his superior, the late Eric Kemp, former Bishop of Chichester, had concerns about Ball's contact with young people. I believe that Eric Kemp knew some of what was going on, if not a lot of what was going on. In 1992, Ball left Sussex to become the Bishop of Gloucester, a more senior position. But a year into the job, he sensationally resigned in disgrace. The complaint to Brixton police apparently involved a 17-year-old novice or trainee monk, though this isn't confirmed. At a news conference, a statement was read from the bishop about his police caution and his resulting resignation. I regret with great penitence and sorrow the circumstances that have led to this police caution. It was disturbing abuse suffered by Neil Todd that prompted the police investigation. When it came to the abuse, the abuse was both sexual, mental, physical, uh, Yes, just not a very nice human being. 
Speaking from his home in Australia in 2012 over the internet, Neil told me he informed church officials in 1992 that Ball had abused him. I was interviewed by a couple of senior clergy. I can't remember the names. Uh, and basically, uh, I was told by my uh, close friends that uh, understood this situation that I was in that Lambert Palace weren't going to pursue the matter and basically they didn't believe my story. And that ended up in the second suicide attempt. Two other victims also told the police they'd been abused by Ball, Cliff James, one of them. It was a straightforward moral choice to support somebody who had suffered more than I had suffered. At the time, it seems as if there was an attempt to try to silence Peter Ball's victims, possibly to try to protect him and the church from scrutiny and scandal. Despite evidence of serious sexual abuse, Ball escaped with a police caution for a single act of gross indecency against Neil Todd. In a statement, the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, expressed his great sorrow at Ball's resignation, describing him as a man who inspired many to deepen their faith, comments echoed by other senior clergy. We must build on all the good and happy memories we have of Bishop Peter. Uh, he's done a tremendous amount of good, and this one incident doesn't undo all of that. Do not want, know what to do. The church was carrying out its own inquiries before the police got involved. A report was also compiled by a private investigator. But the report was never shared with Gloucestershire detectives. Father Brian Tyler carried out the investigations and says he conducted interviews with some of the young men and advised Bishop Peter Ball to accept the police caution but harboured concerns with the outcome. The truth never came out and that the whole thing was being hushed up. Peter Ball most certainly had friends in high places a few years after accepting the police caution, he was provided accommodation by Prince Charles, who he described as a loyal friend. After the whole event, they supported Peter Ball right through the investigation with the police. They basically, the church didn't make any apology to myself. Despite Ball's admission that he'd abused Neil, his superior, the former Bishop of Chichester, Eric Kemp, later referred to Neil Todd in his memoirs as a mischief maker. Haunted by the abuse, Neil tragically took his own life in 2012, never to hear Ball confess to the many offences he committed. It has taken more than 20 years for the truth to emerge, for Peter Ball to admit to his many sexual crimes. The Crown Prosecution Service now accepts that there was sufficient evidence in 1993 that Peter Ball shouldn't have been issued with a police caution, but he should have been prosecuted. What hasn't been examined though is the alleged collusion between Bishop Peter Ball and other abusive clergy. This is Ball with Canon Gordon Rideout jailed in 2013 for child abuse. I have huge concerns about the culture that operated within the church at that time in Sussex in, the, in 1993 and before. I think the, some of the, the culture was, uh, was pretty horrific. Bishop Peter Ball was in regular contact with Eastbourne vicar, Reverend Roy Cotton, who abused many young boys. Old parish magazines show Cotton took children to visit Ball whilst in Sussex for walks and meals. They also went along for discos and to listen to Ball in his chapel. Archive documents show Ball sent teenagers who'd lived with him to live next door to Roy Cotton. Father Roy, as he was known, was at the time a convicted child abuser. Phil Johnson, one of the many Cotton abused. He says Bishop Peter Ball also molested him on one occasion in front of Roy Cotton, something Ball denies. He was Roy Cotton's boss. He was his superior in the church. I already knew of other abusers who knew Cotton and Cotton associated with. So to me, it made me believe at that age that everyone within the church knew about it and the hierarchy knew about it and it made me completely powerless. And because of that, I had to then endure another seven years of abuse.
Bishop Peter Ball was allowed to continue to work in the church after it was known he had committed sexual abuse. He was only stopped in 2010. I believe the abuse, the abuse is still going on in the Church of England and that our priority should be looking for where it is, how it's covered up and stopping it so it never happens again. The Church of England insists it is now a safe place and is instigating its own inquiry. A month ago, Bishop Peter Ball finally pleaded guilty to misusing his position of trust to sexually abuse 18 young men. He'll be sentenced on Wednesday.